Oh, good day. Uh, um, I want to thank you uh, for inviting me to give the uh, address for the uh, the conference. Uh, it's really an honor, and um, really appreciate this opportunity to uh, speak to you for about forty five minutes. Uh, I'd like to also like to thank t uh, Tom Halloran, who got in touch with me and uh, arranged for me to do it this way. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, I can't come to Australia. I really would like to, and uh, I know some of you uh, probably in the uh, in the uh, audience today and. Um, it, it would have been really nice to go down, but it, it's not, we can't, so this is the best that we can do. So uh, I understand um, the uh, theme of the conference is uh, um, from polarization to collaboration, and uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, talk about uh, the collaboration part of it. And uh, so uh, this is based on the paper, which you've had, an, uh, hopefully had an opportunity to at least glance through, uh, which is called, For What Problem is Functional Collaboration uh, the Solution? And uh, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, Tom thought that this would, uh, this particular quote from uh, Lonergan's second collection would um, provide a good uh, context for the theme of the, of the conference. And uh, so, and I'll try to address my remarks to this, uh, perhaps uh, towards the end of my presentation. But doing method fundamentally is distinguishing different tasks, and therefore eliminating totalitarian ambitions. And uh, so we'll, we'll keep that in mind as we move along. Now, all right, here's the solution. <laughs> and you can see the diagram in front of you. And, uh, and I, you'll notice at the top I've changed, uh, most of you would know this is functional specialization, and I've changed it to functional collaboration. Uh, I'm not the only one that's doing that now. Uh, and certainly that you'll notice because of the theme of the conference is collaboration, but Lonergan called it functional specialization, and I think it's significant to talk about functional collaboration. And I'm going to focus on that as we go through. But uh, we'll just look at the diagram now, and this is, the, uh, this is my, I drew this up, it's a little different, but it's uh, basically the solution that Lonergan came up with. And you'll all recognize, uh, I would hope, uh, the um, the uh, categories that are here. So the ones in the middle represent the four levels of intentional consciousness. So experience, understanding, judgment, and decision. And you'll recognize the eight specialties that are derived from that. And you'll know that they're derived uh, by considering time. So we have uh, the, uh, the exercise of recovering the past, which gives us research, is connected to experience. Interpretation, which is connected to understanding. History is connected to judgment. Dialectics connected to decision. And then when we're moving forward, so I would say anticipating the future, what are we going to do? Uh, we have foundations, again, connect, uh, linked to decision doctrines or, I suppose, policy uh, connected to judgment, systematics or planning uh, connected to understanding, and then communications, obviously, uh, it's the output, <laughs> uh, and it's what I'm doing now. And uh, it enters into uh, history, that is, what's going forward. And as you, I put some arrows there, so you see that this is a feedback system, and it loops around, and it's a whole process. Um, we'll get to the line at the bottom, but for the time being, <clears throat> let me just say that that's just the process of history. And I, I just want to make one uh, point now, uh, which will become clear as we move along, that functional specialization, in some sense, is, um, um, while it's part of history, it is a, it in some sense, is a higher control for history. That's certainly how Lonergan meant it. And uh, we'll get to why that is the way it is, and then we'll look at that diagram at the bottom. Okay, so <clears throat> behind every idea is a question, so, or a problem, so we're going to go and look at what the problem or question is. Okay, I, I um, Lonergan uses this language, and he says, oftentimes he'll say in his writings, well, you know, there's approximate uh, context and a remote context. So um, we're going to go first for the proximate context. And uh, for Lonergan in particular, and I think you probably all can relate to this, I certainly can, uh, for him uh, the problem really crystallized uh, uh, um, while he was teaching at the Gregorian in, in Rome. And uh, he would lecture, uh, uh, you could say, in a, uh, he would lecture to 650 students from all over the world who spoke many different languages, um, uh, and uh, he would lectured in Latin, uh, yeah, and which was a common language for all the 650 students. And as he said, it was just crazy. Well, I don't know if he, I, well, I don't know if he said it was crazy, but uh, certainly uh, that it, it, was, it was just a system that, had, that was um, 
uh, at least a couple of hundred years out of date. Uh, uh, and uh, people took notes and he had his say and, uh, you know, there was not a lot of, the collaboration was of that sort. And, I, I you know, ironically, uh, we're still often teaching this way, right? So that's one of the contexts, is the problem of, uh, of a unity within a diversity of a method of collaborating in the, in the uh, uh, acquisition and implementation of, of, of knowledge. Uh, and in this model, you have uh, sort of a leader and a lot of other people. Okay. Now, also related to the proximate context is uh, a typical library, which we certainly have here at, at Memorial University in Newfoundland, and which I'm sure you have in your universities in Australia. And uh, we see that if I, at one point, worked uh, in a library and my job was to shelf books and to make sure that the books were in order. And uh, you all know the Library of Congress system and you know that A is reference, B is philosophy, D is history, H is economics, uh, and so on, right? And uh, so the subjects are divided by, uh, sorry, the division of our labor, if you like, as academics, as intellectuals, as teachers and students, uh, is according to field and subject. So uh, um, subject is philosophy, right? Or you may have, a, uh, you can divide them in different ways, but certainly we have fields and subjects. And Lonergan talks about this in the first couple of pages of Method and Theology. And uh, what's happened, of course, and you may have noticed this as well, and it's certainly relevant to the problem of finding a unity, a way we can collaborate, is that uh, the fields keep uh, dividing and dividing and dividing. So I teach in a religious studies department, and we have anthropologists, uh, that's their subject, or field, rather. Uh, we have uh, historians, we have literary critics, we have philosophers, we have theologians, and so forth, right? And we study things like Israel and Greece and Western civilization, Eastern religions, uh, so forth. And, that, uh, and it, within that, you can subdivide and subdivide and subdivide. So there's all kinds of versions of anthropology, and we all become specialists in narrower and narrower range of subjects. So in that respect, my, I'm a specialist in Lonergan, and in particular, I'm a specialist in his economics and his uh, theory of history. Um, and there are a few other people in the world for whom also share that, that specialty. And, uh, how do we all connect together? Uh, uh, all right, let's have interdisciplinary studies. So we all get together and do interdisciplinary studies, but of course then that becomes a new specialty. So there is a problem of unity, and that's the prox a part of the proximate context. But I want to stretch it out a bit here and talk about the remote context. Now, I don't know if you can see this slide well, but this is a, a diagram representation of the last 13.7 billion years, plus or minus 519 million years. In other words, this is from the Big Bang to the present. And that is Lonergan's remote context. And it is also the remote context of collaboration. Um, there's a lot that could be said here, so I won't say much at all. But I'll just point out, if you look at the slide, that we come into existence, that is the human species, uh, at, uh, at the very edge of this diagram. Not the bright side, or, um, but the open-ended side. And uh, I, just for the fun of it, I tried to figure out uh, um, uh, an analogy that you might get a hold of and um, in terms of how recent we are, um, if you were to uh, walk uh, uh, the circumference of the earth, say starting in uh, um, Ecuador, and you know, like Jesus, you could walk on water and you kept walking around the circumference of the earth, the human species would have come into existence as one third of the way through the last step that you would take. So the remote context is the entirety of the history of the universe, including, of course, evolution and the entirety of history. And, of course, it's ongoing. We're still uh, involved in it. And, uh, in fact, we are in, in some way collaborating with the process of uh, making uh, and uh, moving the universe forward. Okay. All right. So let's jump up to a couple, maybe a, a third of a step back. And we have what I just called proto-human collaboration. And we have here some chimpanzees. Uh, I don't know if they're playing music or um, you know, what they're doing here. Uh, but uh, they're, uh, it looks like they're building something. Uh, but uh, certainly they're collaborating. And, and it's, it's good to know that we also collaborate uh, in the way that chimpanzees and other primates do, or for that matter, other mammals like dogs and 
cats and so on, or even crows. Um, and we have that too. So we, uh, we are a group species, you know. We're, we're, uh, we become persons of distinct character, but uh, we begin by being a, uh, a group species. And there's a part of us that's very much an animal, certainly, uh, and, uh, and we share with uh, chimpanzees and other animals, um, you know, a, a part of ourselves uh, and a way of knowing things that is uh, similar to uh, and alike, sorry, uh, to other animals. Uh, now, something happens with the human species, and uh, so w assuming then that we're in bodies and we are animals, then uh, uh, human beings have this wonderful ability to uh, make tools, create things, and we have a kind of a practical intelligence that seems to uh, really accelerate what we're capable of doing. Uh, if we go back for a moment to the uh, chimpanzees, we'll see that they've got, uh, that's about it for chimpanzees with respect to the use of tools. Uh, there may be a few other things they can do. Uh, probably they can use them to get ants and other things. But uh, they haven't really advanced much uh, uh, with respect to their use of tools. And um, certainly there are different cultures if you move from one set of band of chimpanzees to another. But uh, this, they're, they're not uh, moving along at the kind of pace that we're moving along. You know? So our collaboration, or I'm what I'm going to call here first stage collaboration, and it relates to those of you who know Lonergan's stages of meaning, um, to uh, the first stage of, of meaning. And once we've acquired language, and once, we've, uh, uh, once it's become apparent that we have a kind of creative capacity to uh, come up with ways of doing things uh, in a new way, that uh, the first stage collaboration is um, um, pushed forward, or, or the, uh, the big operator is uh, our practical intel intelligence, our creative intelligence. And so we were able to, to build technologies, and uh, there's an example uh, early on, tribal uh, collaboration. These are Sami people, actually, from northern Lapland. And, I was looking for slides of tents, and this is, I like this particular slide. Uh, tents, of course, are, are a feature of uh, my native land, which is Canada. Um, but the Sami people, and you see here, we've got people, they have tools, they have a tent, and uh, we still ch share, of course, tribal collaboration, uh, whether it's uh, a punk band, uh, a jazz group, uh, or a family, or uh, uh, people that get together to play mahjong on a Friday night. And we certainly have tools, whether it's the tiles or the, or the, uh, the instruments and, uh, and so on. And uh, so we, we are still tribal. And it, and it has features in common with that band of chimpanzees. Um, we come together in certain ways and we form small units. And in here you can see there's more than one tent. So there's probably other families and maybe there's 25 people that work together. And this is the first stage of collaboration with uh, human beings. And it's... Uh, not large. Now, we move along now uh, to, and now we're going to put a date on it. Uh, this is 8,000, uh, about 8,000 before the Common Era, BCE. So, um, you know, about 10,000 years ago. And the tent now is a small city. This is Catalog, I think that's how you say it. And it's actually uh, the, earliest, uh, the earliest evidence they think now, at least the current research, they think that this is where uh, the, uh, human beings uh, first uh, um, seriously got into agriculture and the domestication of animals. Uh, just as an aside, it's interesting that it didn't occur in a rural area, actually. It seems to have occurred in an urban area. And, and you can see that uh, this produced a more complicated kind of collaboration. Uh, um, uh, you can imagine that within a family, of course, you all know there's complicated collaborations in families, but um, uh, can you imagine now you take many families, and in this case, uh, uh, there's going to be a, a more complex division of labor. Uh, in the family, there's, there is a division of labor, clearly. One person does one thing and somebody else does something else. We don't all do the same thing. But it's, it's a collaboration that we all understand, and it's not a particularly complex collaboration, at least in terms of the kinds of tasks that we do. You know, growing up I had to take the garbage out and I helped with the dishes. Right? My mother cooked the meals. Uh, and, you know, my father instructed us on certain things and did a little of the repair and so on. But here we have a Neolithic collaboration where you have to organize and have order uh, with um, a group of uh, maybe a thousand, two thousand people. This is, by the way, for those of you who are in the biblical area, 
uh, a little before the time of Jericho. Okay, so that's the Neolithic collaboration, and you can see now that uh, there, there is a lot more being invented, and of course the uh, things are getting a lot more complicated. Okay, uh, now we move forward about six thousand years, and this is uh, this is Mary. This is actually in Syria, um, and and you can see now that the the each one of the 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 of the units or the uh, the whole of the previous uh, village uh, or, or small urban area. Can be there's many of them here, and in this kind of a setup, you would have people maybe speaking different languages and uh, and and having different tribal associations and so on and so forth. So, and you'll notice there's the wall around the city, so obviously there's competition uh, between one and another city. Uh, so uh, this is uh, we are now entering sort of the period of empire. Uh, this is uh, Mesopotamia and, and Egypt and so on and so forth, and. Uh, uh, and so the, 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 there is a complexity now in the division of labor, and this is where you know you start having priests, and you start having people who specialize in accounting, and you have people who trade, and and uh, this needs to be organized in some fashion so that people can survive. And um, what is kind of interesting about this is that, uh, as I guess Augustine put it in the in his writing in the City of God, um, you know, empires come and go, right? They rise and fall. Um, Mary now is an archaeological dig. It's it's not a city, uh, uh, at least certainly not like this one um, that you see in front of you. Um, and so there's what we're coming to, and I'm moving right along here in a wide sweep of history. But what we're coming to is a um, a, a, a a kind of limit, if you will, uh, uh, to which for which for the development of practical intelligence or for and what I mean by that is that um, empires and the fact that they lead to wars and and rises and falls in that way uh, the human beings uh, are wondering how to organize this right how do you deal now with uh, different cultures all in one place different languages all in one place um, how do you deal now with trade how do you deal with the fact that the horizon of, uh, of empires actually extends beyond the city to include, say, the whole Mesopotamian Valley or all of the Nile or all of the Ganges or the Indus Valley or the Yellow Valley or the Andes. Um, uh, so uh, there's a new kind of um, problem and uh, that's emerging. And uh, uh, Jaspers came up with this, and I'm going to use this as an example. It's a convenient example, I think. Um, uh, there's many ways of understanding the term axial, but certainly Karl Jaspers, a German philosopher, came up with the idea of axial periods. And what he's saying is there's a certain there's a certain point which he identified with the emergence of world religions uh, and the emergence of, of philosophy, where people were seeking a way of understanding the unity of what is now a whole species, in which there are different groups. Um, and um, so uh, what you, tribal religion worked fine, and in the empire, the guy who was running the show could uh, impose the, tri you know, the, the religion of that group on others. But now you have situations in where, where at least some people are, are, are wondering, how do we handle the unity uh, of all of us beyond just our tribal identifications or our city identifications? And there are questions about the nature uh, that are, we're always there, about who we are, because human beings ask those kinds of questions, uh, and uh, how do we make some sense of those things? Uh, and so there, there's emerging, if you will, a period of deep location. Now, for Lonergan identifies, well, he does not actually talk about axial periods, but he does talk about a shift between a first and a second stage of meaning, or a first or second plateau in history. And the, well, when I say here axial period, what I'm talking about is simply the shift uh, in human consciousness out of a world dominated by, pra by a practical common sense um, um, operation to one in which uh, larger questions emerge uh, to which there is a, a, a desire to seek a higher control for collaboration. So this is the axial period. Um, I believe Eric Vogelin stretched it to six, uh, 600 A in the common area to include Muhammad. 
And then eventually he realized that it, it is a shift in consciousness. And this is Lonergan's understanding of this. Certainly it is represented in history, but it, it is a development in, in human consciousness, a development of knowledge. And so the axial period. Okay, well, you see here, this is 387 BCE, and I haven't had these ones labeled, but what we have here are, is the, actually the archaeological digs. On the left, what you have is the, um, the, the site of the original uh, academy, Plato's Academy. And on the, uh, the right, you have the archaeological dig for the uh, Agora, or market place. And um, as you likely know, the um, uh, philosophy uh, developed, which is those larger questions of, about the unity of uh, knowledge, about uh, the origin of things, uh, 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 emerged out of discussion in the marketplace and out of that came the academy and we have with this uh, the emergence of science and um, philosophy and, and so forth right um, and uh, this particular slide I like it's a fragment of Euclid's uh, uh, and uh, it's a very good example of the emergence of a uh, what would be a systematic control of meaning uh, Euclid's if you've uh, you, you we've all done you know Euclid without knowing it, because when we studied uh, grade school geometry, it's uh, the, at least the stuff I studied was based on Euclid. And uh, Euclid, um, well, by way of contrast, if you happen to be in Egypt, uh, they could, uh, they, uh, land by the uh, Nile was prized, and they had land survey methods, and they used a rope with knots, not unlike uh, what, uh, in, in sailing, when they measured speed with knots by using a rope. And they were able to, uh, divide off the land using just counting up the knots in a rope, but they couldn't tell the area. <laughs> and certainly their method was still practical in a kind of first stage common sense way. They just wanted to divide the land up. But what Euclid did was try to systemize things like points and lines. And so his whole delivery is quite different. And this is a very good example of the emergence of, uh, of a systematic or a theoretical kind of control of meaning. And it's, it's a signal of the second stage. Now, when the second stage comes in, we still remain practical, just like when we have the emergence of urban life, we still are collaborating in the way that, that is similar to and uh, alike the collaboration of our uh, uh, pre-human ancestors. Okay, and just to add into the mix, we can see that Jesus also had an agora, and uh, he was... Uh, kind of tossing the money changers out of the marketplace in front of the temple. Uh, they, were, uh, they were engaged in early first century currency exchange. <laughs> and so, so we have uh, the emergence of philosophy, we have the emergence of a universal religion like Christianity. And if we, we jump forward about um, 1,200 years, no more than that, 1,500 years, we end up with a second stage system. Now what do I have here? This is the 13th century and this is a copy of the outside of uh, the Summa Theologica. And in, in this case, uh, philosophy coming from the academy, Aristotle in particular, uh, and all other philosophers between then and then. And uh, certainly uh, the, the writings of the Christian religion, the fathers, uh, and so forth. Um, Aquinas was able to, um, after a couple hundred year development, starting in Abelard, was able to develop a whole uh, system of uh, theology uh, which incorporated philosophy and which uh, connected together all the doctrines of the, of the church in such a way that they were all related to each other in a system. And it was this system, of course, that Lonergan uh, inherited in, a, uh, in a, you know, essentially, uh, uh, in, in which he taught from when he taught it at the Gregorian in, in, the, in the 1950s and early 60s. So this is second stage system and you can see how it bears practically. So uh, we have the, uh, this happens to be the Salisbury Cathedral. Okay. Um, now, we have a new thing emerging here and uh, it probably started with the, with, the, um, with the monks in the 13th century, but certainly uh, uh, this was an important uh, moment, I think, and uh, this is uh, uh, Galileo, uh, who, in a sense, is the most significant early experimental scientist. Uh, he came up with the law of falling bodies, and he actually confirmed Galileo's theory that the, uh, the um, Earth went around the Sun rather than the Sun went around the Earth, which, to the practical-minded, uh, quite obviously, if you look out, the, the Sun goes around the Earth. 
certainly did this morning when I came in. But, um, uh, but in actual fact, it, it appears that that's not the case. And, and Galileo was able to take advantage of an emerging technology, which was the telescope, which had been invented a few years before. And he was able to put his telescope to the sky and discover that, uh, for example, Jupiter had moons. And so Galileo uh, defended uh, the Copernican view, which went against the view taught in the system, uh, which, the, which was um, um, taught and preached uh, in, in the Christian church. And so you have, of course, Galileo being condemned. <laughs> um, okay, so a consequence of a new idea. Uh, a success, and so there's something new happening uh, with the emergence of empirical and science. In fact, it's very important. Uh, Lonergan recognized it, and he's fond of quoting Herbert Butterfield uh, in saying that the, the scientific revolution was, uh, the, the Reformation is just a minor displacement within a system, but the scientific revolution is the start of something new. And this looks forward to the kind of situation that we're in now. So certainly uh, uh, the scientific revolution is important, and it challenges Aristotle's science. Uh, but secondly, we have, uh, and I, this figure I like, Gioban uh, Vico, uh, Gian Battista Vico, excuse me, who wrote the new, uh, the, the new science. And he, this is in many ways the first um, uh, instance of a clear understanding of his, histori what we would call historicity or which Lonergan calls uh, historical mindedness. And it's, the, it, and, it, and it's a very significant development, uh, uh, and it, it is as significant as the development of science. Um, it, it, with historicity, we come to recognize, for example, that there's not just one culture, there's many cultures. Um, uh, in the classical uh, second stage context of the Summa, there was you know, culture, and then there were uh, you know, barbarians, so either you were cultured or you weren't. But now we recognize, of course, that all cultures have, are legitimate and that they can be studied as distinct cultures and they have their own order and, and, and so forth. Um, uh, as well, um, a second thing is that we recognize now uh, some, uh, that we develop, right, that the human species is in some sense developing, um, uh, that I suppose in the larger sense, part of the whole um, process of evolution, which will come a little later with Darwin, but also um, that um, well, if we take, uh, say, the, the field of moral uh, philosophy, in a classical sense, you know, you had moral principles that were true always and everywhere, and then, uh, you know, particular events were contingents, they were known as operables, they were accidents uh, to which you would apply your theory, uh, but uh, in this context, if you were looking at, say, this, the study of ethics, what you're looking, what you um, need to grasp is that moral, the moral point of view is a development of a person. So that uh, my, um, if you like, ethics at five is quite different from my ethics now in my 60s. Uh, and that uh, it's important to know, well, just how old is somebody? Or likewise, uh, um, where, where are you from? <laughs> Uh, I think growing up, uh, as I did in, in uh, Nova Scotia in Canada, is probably quite different than growing up in um, Melbourne, Australia, and surely different than growing up in uh, Tibet. Uh, and so these things are important, and they need to be taken into consideration. So you have, a, you have the emergence now of modern empirical science, uh, a, a new kind of system that, that has to be a whole. It's going to replace the old system, and you have the emergence uh, of the whole idea of historicity. So we now have an issue with system and history. Okay, so I talked earlier about divisions of labor and you can, you know, we can run back and talk about, well, the very minimal deliberation in the tribal context or the division of labor in a um, uh, small urban center, the division of labor in a large city. Um, we can talk about the division of labor that emerges in, uh, in systematic theology in the 13th century um, and so forth. And then with the emergence of science, there's an acceleration, um, certainly in the, in the development of human collaboration and the production of technologies. And, and you know, there's been a cre tremendous creative surge the last couple of hundred years at least with respect to the development of technologies. So much so that when people are against technology, they, they perhaps forget that the pencil and the pen are also technology. 
our technologies. And as you know, actually the fact that I can speak to you this way now is something that I probably couldn't have done 10 years ago. So uh, there's been a tremendous advance because of advances in our, un our understanding of the world through the use of through the sciences, and certainly the lower sciences like physics and chemistry and to a certain extent biology, uh, there's been a tremendous uh, creative uh, uh, acceleration. And uh, Adam Smith noticed this, uh, of course, the economist, and uh, he recognized that uh, economics involved division of labor and that it was more efficient. Right? And so here we have a picture of a, uh, a pin factory, and, he talk and then we have a flow chart. <laughs> in a pin factory. And so it, rather than have everybody do the same thing over and over again, uh, you know, we got to get from wire to pins and we see that you first cut the wire and then you sharpen the end and then you stamp the head and then you solder the end, the head rather, and then you develop pins. And so by dividing up the, 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 uh, the process and having different people do it, the whole process moves faster. It's more efficient. It's a better way, in some respects, a better way to do things. Okay. And uh, I, I, I now, sh we'll move ahead a little bit. I just a little more contemporary example. This is a Dalmer, Dalmer. Uh Oh, it's a nice car to have. These were handmade uh, and cost quite a bit of money. And so, of course, only the people who had a fair bit of money could afford to own a Dalmer. Uh, certainly a nice car. If you get a hold of one, I'm sure now they're still worth a lot of money because they're kind of rare. Whereas there's lots of these ones, some Model T Fords. Uh, um, um, Ford figured out that, you know, if you take the idea of the pin factory and you apply it to the production of, um, of cars, that he was able to make available uh, a car for at least people, for the people who actually worked in his factory. Uh, I recall that uh, in the, uh, my grandparents uh, were married in the uh, mid-20s, uh, 1920s that is, and uh, for their um, uh, honeymoon, they took a Model T car, uh, Ford and drove it a thousand miles, which in those days, of course, was quite an adventure. But uh, he was a, a, a rural preacher, uh, yet he was able to afford a car. Okay, so what's my point? Well, when you, div when, you, when you have a good division of labor, you actually have a more efficient use of resources and a more efficient way of collaborating. And I don't think uh, that that's a bad thing. Um, uh, I think the word efficiency um, uh, certainly can be used in a, in a, in a uh, uh, well, some things that are supposedly efficient are not actually efficient. And uh, having a, a, a proper understanding of what is really efficient, of course, is very important because sometimes what is done in the name of economic efficiency is not efficient at all. But I think essentially as a, as a point, uh, a, as an operating principle here, um, it's better not to have to keep repeating the same task over and over again and having everybody doing it and sort of going around in a circle. We can move forward better if we can actually collaborate and work together towards, you know, good ends, right? So efficiency is not the, the, uh, the entire criteria, but it's certainly a very helpful criteria, and it leads to the acceleration of uh, certainly the production of things. It leads to, uh, uh, it, the, it speeds up the production of things, it, it, uh, so it can be economically efficient. And uh, so we're going to take a look at this idea of a division of labor and see how it uh, might apply to, uh, you know, the work of our work, which is the academic work, uh, uh, the work of a university. Okay, so I want to talk about the second axial period because th this is really the, to go back to the context of uh, uh, Lonergan teaching in the Gregorian, or you and I teaching here today, that um, my analogy here is that, well, there was the first axial age uh, that led to the emergence of philosophy and uh, classical science and universe and world religions, and I think now we're in a second axial age. And uh, it's, um, it's a problematic time that we live in, and uh, it's certainly longer, uh, I think, in, in length than my life. And, uh, and it's, it's, it, we're sort of in the middle of this, and it's, it's ongoing. Um, we have, um, what, what do you do in a world where you have not one universal religion, but many universal religions? Right? So what's the order? What's gonna, uh, what, what is common? You see, that's a question, right? That's a question we haven't answered. Right? What do you do with, the, uh, with all the efficiencies that are going on in a practical sense? Uh, we find that uh, we're back to this problem of an intense fragmentation. Um, 
uh, Lonergan expressed uh, it quite nicely when he talked about Eddington's two table. Now Eddington was a physicist and uh, he remarked uh, that uh, the table that he was uh, uh, eating his lunch on, or say the table on, that's in front of me now, or the podium that's in front of me, is quite different. Uh, uh, it seems to be quite a different reality from the, um, uh, the table as understood and studied by him as a physicist. So the table, you can, I can eat my lunch here, I can put my hands down, I don't sink through. But if, if I were to think of it in terms of uh, physics, it's mostly empty space, right? And uh, so, which is real? This is a problem, right? Is it the world we can touch? Is that the real world? Uh, is it the world of the physicist? Is that the really real world? So we have a, a period of, uh, of, as Lonergan calls it, troubled consciousness. We have a period of, of a intense fragmentation. And so there emerges this ever-present question of how do we unify and or organize? How, how, how do we handle this question about living in, in different kinds of realities with the collision of different kinds of cultures, and different kinds of religions, different kinds of tasks. How are we going to organize our work? Now, Lonergan was, was definitely not satisfied with the classical structure that, that he taught in. And uh, uh, as he put it, it had been around since the Renaissance, pretty much intact. I certainly grew up with that context and was schooled in that context until I went to university. Um, so... That's part of the problem. How do we organize ourselves so that we can have theory implemented in history and do it in a way that's efficient and not just efficient, that is, to do it uh, um, without undue duplication, but also to collaborate in a way that's actually good, right? that actually um, allows us to, if you will, survive uh, in the old sense of the word survive, uh, from the Latin, super livre, to live above, right? To th what we would say now is to thrive, right? You know, how is it that we uh, are going to thrive? How do we handle and deal with um, uh, the conflicts in the world, uh, with the, the kinds of problems that we're creating, whether it's in the environment or the terrible economic uh, issues that we have on the go and so forth? How do we deal with our problems in a way that we might actually solve them? So you can see that this is... He's not talking about a short-term thing, and he's talking about uh, uh, some kind of understanding about how we can uh, all um, uh, cooperate with the creation of the universe, ultimately, if we go back to this notion that we're in time from the Big Bang to whatever the end is. So this is sort of the context, and it's messy, and you know, you could talk for a long, long time about what constitutes this axial age. But for Lonergan, he... He is looking for the principle that's shifting to a new possibility towards a third stage of meaning or a third plateau of history. And, uh, and I mean, this is a Lonergan conference, and you're probably uh, all, at least to some degree, aware of his exploration of cognitional theory. So um, he, he uh, saw that, or he understood, rather, I shouldn't even use the word saw, he, he understood that there was an intelligence that was commonsensical and practical and that there was an intelligence that was theoretical and that the common sense intelligence was, you know, for the here and now, it's a practical issue, you know. In my case right now, I need to have cheat seats in front of me. You can't see them, but I can. I have a watch to keep uh, track of the time and so forth. So that's common sense intelligence. But I'm alluding to um, um, a theory, right, that involves axial periods, stages of meaning, uh, an understanding of, uh, of e evolution and history. And uh, what I'm trying to communicate, actually, is not immediately practical. Uh, what's the connection between the two, right? Okay, so, uh, and he, his way of threading that needle, or his solution was to come to recognize that there is common to both common sense and practical reasoning, uh, or intelligence, that common to this was uh, uh, that we could find, if we were to explore the, our acts of consciousness, uh, our acts of intentional consciousness, if we looked at how we know in both instances, we would find that despite the different intents of common sense and theory, that, we, that there is a, a, a common um, source in universal, in, in, sorry, in human knowing uh, that was there all along. Right? And he called this interiority. So, and uh, 
so he uh, came up with something that he, he called generalized empirical method, right, where you consider both the, uh, the uh, well, to use the quote from uh, Second Collection that people often do, you don't understand uh, objects without understanding the subject that intends the object, and you can't understand the subjects without understanding the objects that they intend. And it is, this is the basis, uh, this was the preliminary to his great discovery of functional specialization. Now, so now we can go to the diagram, right? And uh, we can see that uh, what he has here, if we look at, um, I have below C to E, right? And, uh, um, and you, could, you could speak about history, and I'll put this in a kind of Christian context. We have C as in creation, and we have E as in end. So I, I'm stretching out the notion of common era to include everything from the beginning to the end, right? You know, yeah. And that's history, and it is always uh, going to be practical. Um, you, to actually do something, you have to be practical. Um, however, if you take, if you have an understanding of the levels of consciousness, he was, you're able to come up with a nice, neat division of this labor, right? So that you can kind of specialize in an area without having to, to do all the rest. Now, obviously, it helps if you have a standard model to work with so that everybody appreciates that this is the new division of labor, that it's not going to be based solely on subject or field, but that in every subject and field, there will always be an element of research. In other words, we need data to work with. There will always be um, an element of saying, well, what does that mean? Right? In other words, we need to understand what the data is, and that would be an interpretation, it's certainly. Uh, uh, if we're thinking about, well, what's going forward uh, in, in the text, for example, then we can talk about a history. And, uh, this, and history is a judgment about what's actually moving forward. Right? And finally, what happens if you and I come up with different, uh, well, focus on different data, come up with different interpretations, tell a different story, have a different history, then we have to have a way of working out those differences. Right? And that is di dialectic. So, we can, in a sense, listen to all of history <laughs> and do so in a way that we can be up to date and come up with the best views. And that's the first task. It's a recovery of the past. Right? So we recover the past and we're trying to recycle. We're trying to find the good ideas that are there, trying to understand how it is we got to where we got, uh, to have a good appreciation, in this sense, uh, I suppose, of our traditions. Right? and to reach the best available uh, expression of that. So we listen to the past, and then we say, you know, kind of, well, now what? <laughs> and so we need to anticipate the future. So we're going to work together to create something, and so we have foundations, which is to articulate uh, the basis on which we uh, can move forward, doctrines, which are the, or policies, uh, which are the, the truths that emerge, you know. Uh, um, you know, haste makes waste, well, there's a doctrine, right? Uh, systematics uh, is uh, is an effort to plan, and it, and it's and, and it's uh, a, uh, it's planning an or, uh, ordered, organized planning that takes into account, uh, you know, the development of the species from creation on forward, right? And then the effort to communicate, like I am now, to take an idea and com communicate it out. So right at the moment, I suppose, in a way, you could say that I'm working in the functional specialty of communications. And to do that, I need to have some understanding of, uh, of the results that have preceded me. And you see that if I do communicate, I, my words are now entering into history, and uh, they are data for your understanding. And so the cycle repeats itself, right? And uh, so uh, to go to uh, the quote that Tom uh, sent me in the first instance, uh, you can see that this is a this allows for a unified. Um, I will use the word control uh, simply in the good sense of the word that uh, you have a control of a boiler, for example, uh, so that things don't you know, if it like blow up. <laughs> you need something that measures and controls that helps us to move forward uh, in a in, and uh, divides up the tasks so that uh, uh, I per myself in my work I've stuck doing research and interpretation and. Uh, that's where I published my work, and uh, uh, I have thoughts about all the other ones, but I'm quite happy to just uh, work away on uh, collecting data and, and understanding context. So that's the kind of work I do. But I, I realize that it, it hopefully 
in the future will be part of a project where other people are doing other parts of the work. I'm not inclined to dialectica, uh, but I, have, uh, I know people who are, and so on. Uh, and uh, so I can pass along what I learn in, 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 in by, say, researching in Lonergan's economics, which I do, or interpreting the text, that this is available for somebody who wants to do something in the history of economics or the history of uh, theology and so forth. So functional collaboration is essentially a, it's a division of labor that makes more efficient in the best sense of the word, allows us to collaborate for some good, for good ends so that we can actually collaborate not only with ourselves but collaborate with the creation of the universe. Okay, and so you can kind of imagine what third stage collaboration might, might look like. And when I was casting about for slides, I thought, oh, this one looks pretty good. Everyone's on the floor. It looks a little loose. Uh, um, uh, people are uh, talking in groups, uh, but they have a common goal, right? Uh, they have a, they, 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 they're, they're sort of rowing in the same direction. And there's a creativity to this, right? And it, we're almost back to a picture that might look like the tribe. Uh, that we uh, had at the beginning of, 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 of this, uh, this talk. And it's certainly different uh, than the uh, picture of uh, the classroom at the Gregorian uh, with 650 seats and a professor sitting in what looks like a pulpit um, and delivering the word. Uh, here we are collaborating in the, uh, in, you know, making uh, of the word, uh, making new words and making new things and trying to move forward. So this is just obviously an idealistic vision of things, isn't it, right? Our collaboration is messy and oftentimes conflictual and uh, goes backwards rather than forward. But certainly that Lonergan had this vision, that he was thinking of a way that we would collaborate in the creation of the universe that was both efficient and for good ends and in which each of us was able to specialize in things that suited us and our temperament and so that we could work together so that we might be able to uh, increase an in understanding with an efficiency um, uh, that didn't just produce one unique um, Dale Muir or Bernard Lonergan, but actually could we become kind of, um, uh, maybe not the best analogy, but at least we can produce sort of like Model T frauds, we can all uh, become uh, part of something that's uh, moving forward and, uh, and moving forward together. Uh, in my world, though, of course, you could paint the model affords different colors. Uh, I, I'd like to uh, thank you very much, and uh, hopefully, uh, as I understand it, you're going to come up with some questions for me, and feel free to ask me anything, uh, either um, in the context of this uh, talk, certainly in the context of the paper, which is sort of gets into some much more detailed elaboration, and, uh, and I'm quite happy also to answer questions on economics because uh, I know some of you might be interested, and I, I'm, never, I'm, I'm never tired of speaking about that. So at any rate, I thank you very much, and uh, I hope you have a good conference.